please join me in welcoming our friend and Emancipet's Chief Executive Officer, Ms. Amy Mills. As I said, I'm really excited to be here um, with you tonight, and so I, I have to start off by um, coming clean. Um, you guys know that old bumper sticker uh, that says, I wasn't born in Texas, but I got here as fast as I could? The truth is, I did not start Emancipet, um, but um, I've had the privilege of serving as the CEO for the last 13 years. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So tonight, I want to share a little bit about what our first 20 years have been like from my perspective, and I want to share a little bit with you about what our growth plans look like next. So I can remember my first day at Emancipet 13 years ago pretty vividly. I walked up to what looked like an old abandoned building, except it had this giant faded sign on the outside that said, Emancipet World Headquarters. <laughs> and I honestly couldn't tell if it was an homage to the Armadillo World Headquarters or if it was an act of supreme optimism. Because back then, Emancipet was only one mobile clinic that technically did not work that day and that abandoned building. Everything inside that makeshift clinic, from the chairs in the lobby to the desks and the surgery tables, was used, thrifted, and duct taped together. Also, the staff did not know I was starting that day, so it was a little bit awkward, and some of them seemed less than enthusiastic to meet the new boss. But that day, I watched an incredible team of people perform 40 spay-neuter surgeries. And I sat in our lobby with this woman who brought in this beautiful, white, blue-eyed, kind of pit bull boxer mix. She brought her in to be spayed, and we sat in the lobby and talked about her life. She told me why she couldn't afford to let her dog have another litter, even though she confided in me that those puppies were the cutest of anybody's on the block. <laughs> I went home that night, and I knew two things for sure. One, I absolutely had my work cut out for me. And two, it may take a while, but we were going to change the world. For the next few years, we rolled up our sleeves and we got to work transforming that grassroots spay-neuter clinic into a professional, sustainable, and high-impact nonprofit organization. We expanded our services. We developed new programs and partnerships to meet the needs of a growing and changing Austin. We developed SOPs and budgets and core values and employee handbooks and other exciting, sexy things like that. <laughs> By 2011, we had the proof of concept for something that hadn't existed before, but that the world badly needed. A low-cost veterinary clinic model capable of consistently delivering high-quality, compassionate veterinary care to pets whose owners had been financially excluded from the veterinary industry. And it was financially sustainable. That clinic model was based on the three most important lessons that we learned in our first decade at Emancipet. Those lessons are that number one, everybody, no matter how much money they have, loves their pets, and they'll do the right thing for them when they're given a chance to. Number two, low-income consumers will pay for veterinary care if it is priced appropriately and delivered respectfully. And three, that social change was really possible. We were seeing community-level shifts in behavior and cultural norms around pet care, all stemming from individual pet owners having transformative experiences in our clinics. By 2012, we felt ready to start growing outside of Austin. We chose to scale by replicating that clinic model in new cities and by teaching what we had learned to others through a new training and consulting program. Since we launched that growth plan, some incredible things have happened. We've opened five new clinics in four cities, and we have two clinics in the works right now. Our current network of seven Emancipet clinics, as you heard earlier, 
sees 150,000 visits every single year and growing. Those services, thank you, yes. Thanks to the staff. Those services now are things like spay-neuter, dental care, heartworm treatment, skin, ear, and eye issues. And our staff does it with so much care and compassion that we consistently have the highest net promoter scores, those are customer service scores, that are possible in any industry. With our training program, thank you, thank you. With our training program, we have trained 996 professionals from 39 states to become stronger leaders and advocates for animals and underserved people, and we've helped them launch or expand programs in their own communities. We were selected as one of five surgical team leads for the Spayathon for Puerto Rico, which is the world's largest MASH-style spay-neuter program, and we've done almost 5,000 surgeries there in our first year alone. Personally, I think the most incredible thing we've achieved is that our most recent clinic was featured in two different interior design magazines with not a single thrift store or duct taped item anywhere to be found. <laughs> yes, yes for that. <laughs> so I still keep a photo of our old clinic with that faded sign on it because it's a really important reminder to me of our humble beginnings but our very ambitious dreams. When people ask me how we got from there to here, I honestly don't have some sophisticated master plan to share with everybody. When your job is to solve a complex social problem, you've gotta find ways to break it down and make it feel solvable. So for a long time, what that meant was that our strategy was to just do the next right thing, as Glennon Doyle would say. Not that that was always easy or that we even knew what the next right thing was going to be, but in general, the next right thing was Whatever would move us towards a future where more people could afford to take care of their pets. Because that would move us towards a future where more people and pets could stay together and live long, happy, healthy lives. The thing is, the problem that Emancipet's been trying to solve is huge and complex. It's actually what we call a wicked problem in the social sector. A wicked problem is one that is deeply intertwined with other social problems or that has a scope that's really large or difficult to define. So our particular wicked problem is the inaccessibility of veterinary care for millions of Americans. It has its roots, as Matt said, in other wicked problems like poverty, like economic inequality, and even racism. And that problem is the root cause of other problems like animal homelessness and neglect and dog and cat overpopulation. And the scope of this problem is also large and it's difficult sometimes to wrap your arms around it. More people own pets in the United States than at any other point in our history. And I don't know if you knew this, but just recently we passed a certain milestone. More US households contain pets than children for the first time. Yes, boo, children. <laughs> so the question that we have is, how many of those animals need our help, right? So here's what we know. We know that in households with the income of $50,000 and below, those pet owners struggle to afford some veterinary care some of the time. And we know that financial barriers increase as household income decreases. So we estimate that there are about 53 million dogs and cats in the United States living in households with income under 50,000, meaning they're gonna need some help. Of those 53 million dogs and cats, 25 million of them live in households with income under $25,000 a year, meaning they are rarely, if ever, getting the veterinary care they need, causing unnecessary pain and suffering, not just for those animals, but for their owners. This is not because these pets aren't beloved members of their families. I can tell you thousands of stories that prove that they are. It is simply because in most low-income communities across the country, low-cost veterinary care is just nowhere to be found. But Emancipet is changing that. Our clinics have the power to transform communities into places where no one ever has to choose between purchasing medication for themselves or for their pet. Where no family 
ever has to opt to euthanize their sick or injured pet just because they can't afford the cost of treatment. And where no one ever has to give up their pet to a shelter because they can't afford care. Our clinics are a desperately needed lifeline for low income and struggling pets, pet owners who are just trying to keep their pets. But here's what gives me the most hope. We're not the only ones doing this anymore. For a lot of the last 20 years, Emancipat sometimes felt like an outsider in both the veterinary industry and in animal welfare. We were sometimes the lone voice in a room saying, pets don't belong in shelters, they belong with their owners, no matter how much money those owners have. And the low cost veterinary care was the key to making that possible. But we aren't alone anymore major animal welfare organizations like the ASPCA, who we heard from earlier, are prioritizing access to vet care. Major funders like PetSmart Charities have set new goals to fund access to care initiatives at deeper levels. The veterinary professional associations like the AVMA have formed working groups to address this access to care crisis. And major universities, like the University of Tennessee, are forming these multidisciplinary departments now to look at access to vet care and study its impact on not just animal, but human health. Times are not just changing, guys. They've changed. Suddenly, access to vet care is the hip new animal welfare movement that everybody wants to be a part of. And yes. <laughs> And I'm going to tell you the really weird thing about that. After 20 years of doing this, Emancipat is no longer this ragtag team of outsiders. We're the leaders. Emancipat is having a moment. Yes. So what do you do when you're having a moment? You seize that moment. <laughs> So earlier this summer, our board and senior staff, we gathered together to have a retreat. We wanted to consider our first 20 years and think about what our next might look like. When we gathered, it happened to be the 50th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing, so we took that as our inspiration. Now, we weren't really inspired by the moon landing itself. What inspired us was President Kennedy's decision to set this goal, to put a man on the moon in under a decade without having any certainty that such a goal was even possible. Now, at the time that goal was set, there was no funding for a mission like that. The Johnson Space Center did not yet exist. We had not even put a human being into orbit, and we didn't have the technology or the materials to do so. Even the metal alloy we would eventually need to use in our shuttles did not exist yet. But as a leader, President Kennedy knew that if he could set a bold goal, one that would capture our imaginations and feel a little bit impossible, that would spark the best parts of the American soul, and it would unite and inspire people. In the brilliant words, not of JFK, but of his speechwriter, Ted Sorensen, in his famous speech, um, this is what they said. We choose to go to the moon in this decade, not because it is easy, but because it is hard because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win. I have thought so much about that speech, and I've thought a lot about the wisdom of setting a goal that isn't technically achievable in the present moment. And I think the brilliance of it is that it is only through developing the plan and executing the plan to achieve this insane thing that it becomes achievable. In the beginning, all we have to do is accept the challenge and take the leap of faith that through the process will become possible of doing what had been impossible. We weren't technically capable of putting a man on the moon at the time that goal was set. And yet, after eight years of working on it, we did it, two years ahead of schedule. When we met this summer, that was the kind of goal we wanted to set for Emancipet. We knew that our wicked problem 
like all wicked problems, would just keep on creating suffering in the world if we didn't first give ourselves permission to believe that it could be solved instead of just made more tolerable for those experiencing it. We wanted to set a goal so bold that pursuing it would change us, and by changing us would change the world. So we did. We set an incredibly bold goal. And I'm going to share it out loud tonight for the first time. Our bold goal is that by the year 2028, everyone in the United States will have access to veterinary care they can afford. Yes. So before we get too crazy, let me answer a few questions. Yes, that means all 53 million dogs and cats whose owners are struggling right now to afford veterinary care are going to be served in some way. Yes, you may notice that that deadline is in less than 10 years. If we can put a man on the moon in eight years, we can solve this problem in eight years too. But no, it does not mean we think Emancipate's going to do this alone. In fact, we know we can't. This problem is too large and too complex for any one organization or even one industry to solve alone. It is going to take a collaborative, innovative, network set of strategies across multiple sectors. It is going to require new ways of thinking and doing business, and Emancipet intends to be at the forefront of this emerging movement. We will be opening new clinics and scaling much faster. We will be empowering those who want to open their own, and we will be leading supporting, and sometimes agitating our friends, our partners, and elected officials to spur progress forward. Some of you might hear this and think this sounds impossible, and I completely get it. But if the moonshot taught us anything, it's that we have no idea what's possible until we begin, and this work has already begun, and you are all a part of it by being here tonight. This gala was never just going to be a fundraiser or a party, although it is a really amazing party, Missy. <laughs> this gala is a bridge from who we were to who we want to be. And Emancipet is coming out tonight as a bolder version of ourselves with an unapologetic dream to solve this problem. And we want and need all of you to be a part of it. We need you to be a donor and a sponsor and a supporter and a cheerleader and a friend. And I don't just mean tonight. I mean tomorrow and for the next eight years. Guys. If you'll take a quick peek at your table, there's some white boxes with blue ribbon or a star on them, and it says you're not allowed to open them yet. Um, you're allowed to open them now. I'd like you to open those, because there's a little gift from Emancipet inside, and I want to talk to you a little bit about that gift. I know it's a little bit dark, so I'll give you a minute. So inside your boxes are some little pins. And here's what I'm going to ask of all of you. I ask you to wear this pin as a reminder that tonight, Emancipet set this bold goal that by 2028, everyone in the United States will have access to veterinary care. It is a huge challenge, but just like JFK said, it is a challenge we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one that we too intend to win. But if I can just speak on a more personal level, this pin is more than that to me. This pin, which I ask you to wear, is a reminder to each of us that we have more power than we think to create the kind of world we want to live in. We have our fair share of wicked problems and big challenges in this country right now and in our individual lives. And those challenges can feel overwhelming and daunting and huge, but our challenges are not bigger than us. Our problems are never bigger than our hearts and our compassion 
and our creativity and our will to solve them. Y'all, we've got this. Let's be bold. Thank you for being here tonight. I appreciate you guys so much.